know, we're it's not the greatest week, but we're going to have a great time anyway. We're going to learn a lot from Dr. Wallace. We are thrilled to have him with us this evening, and I won't waste any of your time. Dr. Wallace is visiting us from Dallas Theological Seminary. He is a textual critic. Is that the proper right. proper terminology for you? So, and he's here this evening, and he's going to tell us about the speak to us about the validity of the New Testament. So, without any more further ado, Dr. Wallace, it's all yours. should have time for a, a Q&A afterwards, but I wanted to uh, address an issue. And I'm going to assume that we have a mixed audience between Christians and non-Christians here, uh, so that uh, some of you will uh, perhaps be a little bit disturbed about what I have to say, others may be encouraged by what I have to say, but we'll see how this goes. And this is a, a question, I think it's a very serious question today, how badly did these ancient scribes corrupt the New Testament? Now, to set a little framework for us, we don't have the original manuscripts of the New Testament anymore. Uh, they all turned to dust within probably a hundred years of the production of them. Uh, we do have some ancient church fathers in the second century talking about, uh, well, the originals of Paul's letters are over here, uh, but uh, that particular church father is, has been discredited. And another one talks about the earliest manuscripts of Revelation uh, he's writing 60, 70 years after John wrote Revelation, and, he's, and he doesn't talk about the original. So, as far as we know, they, they, they turned to dust by the end of the second century. If we had them, we would probably know that we had them. Or at least we'd say, this is a good guess for one, because these original manuscripts were all written on scrolls. That's the book form that existed in the ancient world. All of our copies are not on scrolls. They are on what's called a codex, and that's you know like a modern book bound on one side and cut pages at each turn. Uh, the codex form was invented by the end of the first century, and if all of our New Testament manuscripts are written on a codex, but we have pretty strong evidence that the New Testament itself was not originally, then that means everything we have are copies. Uh, if we found a manuscript that was written on a scroll, and if uh, let's say it's one of Paul's letters and the letters at the end of the, uh, the manuscript were a little bit larger and perhaps not as uh, finely written, then that would be a very good shot for us to say that's the authentic original manuscript of Paul because uh, he, he would always use a secretary or an amanuensis to write his, his documents. And that secretary uh, would, uh, it, it, oh, the sound's on, I was, I'm sorry, just checking. You all can hear me fine, right? Okay. The secretary would be professionally trained so he could write out these letters uh, carefully. And Paul says in Galatians 6, see what big letters I write with. Some people think he says that because he had been blinded on the road to Damascus. But more likely, he said, these are the, letter, the big letters I'm writing with precisely because I'm not the trained secretary. And in 2 Thessalonians 3, he says, I sign all of my letters at the end. And it means he takes the pen from the secretary and writes a, a note, and you can see a different handwriting. We don't have that in any of our manuscripts, so we know the originals are gone. Well, that leaves us with copies that we're trying to figure out uh, from these copies, how to get back to the original wording. And that's what I've spent the last, well, the last 35 years, actually, I should say the last 43 years of my life working on, uh, starting even in college. So we'll look at some of the issues today. And I want to start by quoting from that great scholar, Dan Brown, uh, in his book, Da Vinci Code where he says, the Bible has evolved through countless translations, additions, and revisions. History has never had a definitive version of the book. Now, in a sense, we could say, yes, that is correct. But this really is just another way to say, uh, you Christians, you claim that you have the Bible in the original, you have, you've got the Word of God. How can you possibly make that kind of a claim when the Bible has been translated and revised and translated over the centuries, there's no way you can possibly get back to the original. So we're going to wrestle with that question, but it's been asked or stated in some more sophisticated ways. Uh, C.J. Werleman, who wrote a book called Jesus Lied, he's, he's a, one of the new atheists. Uh, his first book was, it had a very provocative title, this is not so bad, but a very provocative title of God Hates You, Hate Him Back, which I think is a, a very funny title for an atheist. Yeah. This God who does not exist hates you, so go ahead and hate something back that doesn't exist. 
But um, anyway, it's, uh, that's where he uh, rolls. So he said, we don't have any of the original manuscripts of the Bible. That's true. The originals are lost. That's true. We don't know when and we don't know by whom. That's also true. What we have are copies of copies. True. In some instances, the copies we have are 20th generation copies. I have no idea where he got that from and it cannot possibly be verified that we're waiting 20 generations before we get any copies. So he builds all the stuff up off of true statements and I'll tell you what his source is for this who doesn't mention anything about 20th generation copies. But here's another uh, scholar, M.M. Al-Azmi, he's a, a Muslim, a British Muslim, and his book, The History of the Quranic Text from Revelation to Compilation, has uh, sold very well in Britain, and he compares it to the Old and New Testament, and here's what he has to say. The Orthodox Church, being the sect which eventually established supremacy over all the others, stood in fervent opposition to various ideas, also known as heresies, which were in circulation. These included adoptionism, the notion that Jesus was not God but a man, docetism, the opposite view that he was God and not man, and separationism, that the divine and human elements of Jesus Christ were two separate beings. In each case, this sect, the one that would rise to become the Orthodox Church, deliberately corrupted the scriptures so as to reflect its own theological visions of Christ while demolishing that of all rival sects. Well, now that's a pretty sophisticated and pretty damning statement. Where does C.J. Werleman, where does M.M. al Azami, where do they get their information from? Well, there are some scholars who are writing on this, but there's one scholar in particular who has written extensively in this area uh, for, for trade books, and uh, it's uh, Dr. Bart Ehrman. He's the James Gray Professor of Religious Studies at uh, North Carolina Chapel Hill University, uh, a very fine scholar. He's a Moody Bible Institute and Wheaton College graduate, two evangelical schools. He grew up as an evangelical, so he became a Christian when he was a teenager. Went on to Princeton Seminary for his master's degree. Princeton is just one of the world-class uh, schools and then he got his PhD there as well under a doctor, a scholar by the name of Dr. Bruce Metzger. Metzger uh, was, uh, he died just uh, five or six years ago. He was considered by many to be the finest New Testament textual critic of the 20th century. And uh, I've known Bart for 32 years. I've known Metzger for even longer than that. Um, but uh, anyway, he decided to write a popular book about uh, what happened to these manuscripts. And through the process, after studying these things, Bruce Metzger was an evangelical. And years after that, Bart Ehrman started to turn further and further to the left until today he considers himself an agnostic. We've debated each other uh, three times. We're friends, but we debate, debated each other one time at uh, New Orleans Baptist Seminary, and the next time he wanted to debate in a place that would be more neutral, and it was going to be in Dallas, so it was at Southern Methodist University which actually is not neutral, even though it has Methodist in the name, there's not much Christian going on at SMU. And then uh, the third one, what I, I said, let's go ahead and do another one at, at your school. And so he was happy about that. But um, here's what he says, and he's quoting Jesus, one of the things he, he says, not only do we not have the originals, we don't have the first copies of the originals, we don't even have copies of the copies of the originals, or copies of the copies of the copies of the originals. That's as far as he goes. So that's, I think that's four generations, not 20 generations, like uh, C.J. Werdelman said. Now, I'm not even sure if, if this is something that uh, can be demonstrated. In fact, it can't be demonstrated. But uh, this book came out in 2005. And within uh, uh, a couple of months, it, it became very well known so that um, John Stewart on The Daily Show, you know, the comedian John Stewart, had Ehrman on, and he talked to him about this book, and he said, man, this is... This is a fascinating read how the church has revised the, the Bible through the centuries and changed things and added stuff and taken things out. And uh, he said, uh, it, it almost seems more godly, more spiritual that way. And uh, then uh, uh, John said, uh, Stuart said that, uh, well, I want to congratulate you, sir. This is one hell of a book, which is not normally the kind of adjective you'd use for a book about the Bible, but that's what he said. And uh, the next day, this book was number one on Amazon. In the first three months, 100,000 copies were sold. I think it's well over a million now. But it's had a huge influence uh, among people who are trying to find out about the Bible.
and uh, like to get a, a more skeptical perspective. And he said, in one place, the more I studied the manuscript tradition of the New Testament, the more I realized just how radically the text had been altered over the years at the hands of the scribes. It would be wrong to say, as people sometimes do, that the changes in our text have no real bearing on what the texts mean or on the theological conclusions that one draws from them. Now keep that in mind, saying that the, these changes that the scribes made change the theological conclusions of what the Bible, the books of the Bible are all about. Well, we're going to come back to Ehrman towards the end of this lecture, and here's two attitudes that I want to recommend that we need to avoid. And uh, it doesn't matter what uh, stripe you are theologically, if you're from atheist to fundamentalist, these are two attitudes that I think rational people should avoid. And the first one is radical skepticism. Uh, there is absolutely no need to be completely skeptical about the text of the New Testament, and I'll show this by serious historical concrete evidence that demonstrates that if we're skeptical about the text of the New Testament, the skepticism we'd have to have about all other ancient knowledge from the Western world simply vanishes. It, 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 it can't count for anything. So that is something that is not necessary. The other attitude is absolute certainty. Uh, now, I don't know that I've seen this in Oklahoma, but I have seen it in Texas a few times, and in Arkansas, and in Ohio. Uh, there are people who will say, uh, if the King James Bible was good enough for St. Paul, it's good enough for me. <laughs> and you know, when I hear that, and they're all, they're, they're completely serious, I say, well, how about them cowboys? You know, it's, that's about a level of talk we can have after that point, so. Um, but uh, even Christians who use modern translations tend to have absolute certainty. It's printed in my Bible. That's what the original Bible actually says. And they don't realize that Bibles change. Uh, the, the, even the King James Bible changed. It went through three major revisions, the last one in 1769, where there's over 100,000 changes from the original. Most of them are spelling changes, but there are still some actual textual changes. The NIV first came out, the New International Version, which is the most popular Bible in history. It surpassed the King James several years ago. Uh, came out in 1978 and then in 1984 for the whole Bible. That uh, translation uh, is, has been revised by the TNIV and the NIV 2011, and there are some textual changes, not too many, but they do change what they are translating from. That's a textual change. So when you have a Bible and you go to church, you say, this is the Word of God, in almost every respect, I'd say that goes back to the original. But in some respects, we don't know. And that's part of what uh, I want to address today. So those are two attitudes to stay away from. But just because you can't have absolute certainty doesn't mean you have to have radical skepticism. So there's four questions I want us to answer, and we're going to spend the vast majority of our time on the very first one. How many textual variants are there? And I'll define what a textual variant is and all that. Then what kinds of textual variants are there? So the first one has to do with quantity. How many differences do we have among the manuscripts? The second has to do with quality. And that is, are these serious? Do they impact anything? What changes do they make to what Christians believe? And then we'll get zero in on that second question a little bit more. What theological beliefs depend on textually suspect passages? And then finally, has the essence of the Christian faith been corrupted by the scribes? Well, we'll see if that's the case. So, we start then with this first question, but we have a preliminary question. Don't we have the original New Testament more? I've already addressed that, but let me just say it, say it two ways. First of all, uh, the originals have disappeared, but, okay, so those they're gone, but if all the manuscripts agree with each other, then we could still construct the original, because they would agree. That would tell us probably what the original said. That's a, a dogma for Muslims and the Quran, but it's not something that Christians believe about the Bible. And as a, as a matter of fact, it's also not true for the Quran. I have seen copies of the Quran where there are erasures and changes. But for the Bible, uh, we have no two manuscripts for the New Testament that agree completely. When you look at even the two most closely related manuscripts through the first eight centuries of the church, they have between six and differences with each other per chapter. Now you multiply that out by 260 chapters and you've got couple thousand differences. Those are the two most closely related ones. So, because of the disappearance of the originals <coughs> and the differences among the manuscripts, we have to do textual criticism. <coughs> so, number of variants. What is a variant? 
It's any place among the manuscripts in which there's variation in wording, which includes word order, omission, or addition of words, even spelling differences, all that counts. What doesn't count is punctuation and capitalization. The originals didn't have punctuation, and all of the letters were capitalized in the original manuscripts. Uh, they, they used just what's called uncial letters or majuscule letters. But um, so you actually had to have word division. Those, the, the words were not even divided among themselves originally. And, and ancient Greeks knew how to do, do this kind of reading because words can only end in certain kinds of letters. And uh, so if, if you have a tau, you know it's not that. At the end of a word, it's got to be beginning or in the middle of something. But um, um, a variant is not. And here's, here's the thing. I just want to correct if there's some, some Christians in here. You may have heard this. You may have heard that a variant is a difference between, uh, say you've got in John chapter 4, verse 1, this is a, a place where there's a textual variant. You've got some manuscripts that say, when Jesus knew, and other manuscripts say, when the Lord knew. Well, uh, the difference is simply one word uh, in, in Greek. It's between Jesus and the Lord. And the question is, if you have, say, 500 manuscripts that have Jesus and 500 that have Lord, doesn't that count as 500 variants? And the answer is no, it does not. It counts as one variant. A variant is any difference from a base text, whatever text you start with, and you're talking about how many differences you have among all the manuscripts from that base text. But uh, if you have a million manuscripts that say the same thing, that still counts as just one variant. So keep that in mind. So there, there were evangelicals uh, actually 50 years ago who argued this because they wanted to lessen the blow of how many variants there were because it scared them. But they didn't know what, they really just didn't know what they were talking about. They were not textual critics and still this makes it into apologetics literature. So, the quantity of variants, here's a good place to start with. The Greek New Testament has approximately 140,000 words in it. Uh, to be more exact, it has 138,162. But you don't want to hear that because uh, uh, I'm a very anal person, very analytical, and that's that I, I like to count things. So, um, textual variants, we have approximately 400,000. That's approximately two and a half words, or two and a half variants for every word in the Greek New Testament. Now, that number, if that's all the data we had, skeptics would rejoice, Christians would get crushed. And this is typically where a lot of skeptics leave the matter. They say this is the situation and so they kind of create chicken littles and I, 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 I'm quite convinced that at least tens of thousands of college age uh, kids have abandoned the Christian faith because of the writings of Bart Ehrman and others when they read this kind of statistic. Now we're going to do a Paul Harvey tonight and look at the rest of the data or tell you the rest of the story. So. Here's the point to make about all this. The reason we have a lot of textual variants is that we have a lot of manuscripts. If we had one manuscript, it would have no variants. That wouldn't give us any certainty that it goes back to the original. And as a matter of fact, in 1516, when Desiderius Erasmus published the first Greek New Testament on, on a printing press, uh, he had one manuscript for the Gospels, one for Revelation, one for different parts of the New Testament. He ended up using only seven manuscripts and he didn't compare them when they overlapped, which was not very much at the time. So he's basing his published Greek New Testament, which is the Greek New Testament that stands almost directly behind the King James Bible on late manuscripts, the oldest of which came from the 11th century. And so he's writing 500 years later. He's got a single manuscript, no variants, and uh, that doesn't tell us it goes back to the original. 200 years later, a fellow by the name of Richard Bentley wrote a book called Remarks Upon a Discourse of Free Thinking. Richard Bentley was, uh, uh, um, he was a Cambridge scholar. And I've seen his actual papers at, at Cambridge University. I spent one of my sabbaticals there. And Bentley had some terrific principles on how to reconstruct the original of the New Testament working on ancient manuscripts and all. And what had happened in 1707 was a, a two-volume work came out by a man named John Mill that was the New Testament compared to 99 manuscripts. He spent his entire adult life uh, examining 99 manuscripts, all the manuscripts he could get a hold of, as uh, 99 Greek manuscripts, as well as the New Testament translated into other languages 
and quotations by ancient scholars known as church fathers. And he published this two-volume work and listed 30,000 textual variants in 1707. It was a remarkable uh, achievement. And then he did what every scholar who publishes his magnum opus should do exactly at that point. He died one week later to the day. So he could bypass all the critical reviews, you know, and don't have to worry about those. So there were uh, Christians, uh, Protestants, who were upset about this because they said, this is the work of the devil. John Mill was just looking at these manuscripts. So he's saying a manuscript of the Greek New Testament is something produced by the devil. He was just doing a good historical study, which is what I think the hallmark of evangelical and orthodox Christianity has always been. And then Catholics looked at it and they said, uh, we're really happy about this because this shows that you Protestants, you have a paper pope, but he has footnotes. And his footnotes, you're not sure what he's really trying to say here. He doesn't really speak ex cathedra. So Richard Bentley comes along six years after John Mill had died. And he wrote this. If there had been but one manuscript of the Greek Testament at the Restoration of Learning about two centuries ago, uh, and he's talking about when Erasmus published his Greek New Testament in 1516, then we would have had no various readings at all. And would the text be in a better condition then than it is now that we have 30,000 variant readings? It is good, therefore, to have more anchors than one, and another manuscript to join the first would give more authority as well as security. What Bentley was saying was, when I, when I compare two manuscripts, maybe they're both dated at the same time, maybe exactly the same year. Sometimes we have dates written in the manuscripts, but more often we can date them by uh, how they, uh, there's, it's called paleography, examining the handwriting and seeing. We can usually get within a century, sometimes within 50 years of, of the date of these manuscripts. But Bentley's saying, let's say you have two manuscripts that are, are from the same era, the same century. And one of these manuscripts in, say, Romans 5.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Period. And the other manuscript says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but do walk according to the Spirit. Well, what Bentley was saying is you can compare these two and you can look at church history and say, all right, which one seems to be more likely what Paul would have written? And on the basis of what we see in church history, we discover that as time rolls on, Christians add more and more requirements to what salvation is all about. And so uh, Bentley would say, even though these two manuscripts are, say, from the 10th century, one of them goes back to a much earlier date for its ancestor, the one that has the shorter reading. I'll give some illustrations as, as we look at this a little bit later. But that's the basic way they did it. Then if you have earlier manuscripts that confirm that, that really strengthens the case. Well, what New Testament scholars have is what's called an embarrassment of riches. We have, as of, I believe it was November, the numbers have been updated, 5,839 Greek New Testament manuscripts that exist today. Uh, that's an enormous number, and I, I'm the uh, executive director and founder of the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts. We started that institute 12 years ago, and we go all over the world to photograph, digitally photograph, these New Testament manuscripts. Uh, we've, I, I've been in 36 countries now, and uh, to photograph all of them is going to be an enormous undertaking. The average Greek New Testament manuscript is 459 pages long. That's the average. Now the older ones, the papyri, they're all fragmentary, but some of those fragments are rather large. We have one that has almost the entirety of John in it, another one that has most of John and most of Luke. We have uh, the earliest manuscript of Paul's letters has uh, eight of those letters still in it, nine of those letters, and uh, uh, a couple of the books, Hebrews and 1 Corinthians, are, are almost completely intact, and even the rest of it is about three-fourths of each page is, is intact. So these manuscripts, Almost none of them are complete New Testaments, but most of them are virtually complete for what they were trying to cover. Most try to have the Gospels, some just Paul's letters, some just the Book of Acts, and some, some just Revelation, this kind of thing. Now, that comes to a grand total of over 2.6 million pages of manuscripts to photograph. We shoot them one page at a time. We don't even do two pages at a time. So that, what that means is that's great job security for me. We've done over a quarter of a million pages so far, uh, and uh, we, we, we've got a long ways to go. If you want to go and see some images of these manuscripts, 
The website is CSNTM, uh, Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts.org. And the images are up there for free. Uh, we want to make these available to scholars throughout the world. Well, the New Testament was translated very early on into other ancient languages. And one of the great advantages of these ancient languages is that uh, once the New Testament gets translated in, from Greek into another language, there often and usually is not any correspondence going back and forth between the two languages later on. Because you get some guy who's able to translate the, the New Testament into Latin, he just doesn't want to go back and look at Greek. And so they take on a life of their own. So we might have, say, manuscripts in Latin from the fourth century, but they go back to when the Latin New Testament was first translated in the second century. And if those manuscripts agree, the fourth and fifth century manuscripts agree, that tells us what the Latin text of the second century actually said, because they don't have any more interaction with the Greek. And so we have uh, manuscripts in uh, Latin alone, over 10,000 manuscripts of the New Testament in Latin. It's more than what we have for Greek because Latin became the lingua franca of Europe starting in about the 4th century. It started sweeping across all of Western Europe and uh, the church uh, grew uh, simultaneously with it so we have far more manuscripts in Latin than, than in Greek. But the New Testament was also translated very early on in other languages, especially Syriac and Coptic and uh, then Georgian and Gothic and Ethiopic and uh, Armenian and uh, Arabic. Um, uh, Old Church Slavonic, all sorts of languages, and we have at least five to 10,000 manuscripts in these other languages. Now these numbers are the same numbers that I have used when I have debated skeptics about the text of the New Testament, and they've never been debated. Uh, they, they, this is something that they would agree with. Now let's say what that looks like is we got somewhere between 20 and 25,000 copies of the New Testament in these ancient handwritten manuscripts prior to the time of the printing press. That's enormous. That's a lot of manuscripts. Now, if we had a magic wand and could just wipe all these out in one fell swoop, we would still not be left without a witness. And that's because of church fathers, uh, ancient scholars, uh, presbyters, elders, bishops, pastors, priests, uh, scholars who would write homilies, sermons, theological treatises, commentaries on the books of the New Testament. And these men did not have the gift of brevity. They were very verbose. Uh, there has been a place in Boiron, Germany, where they've been documenting the Church Fathers' quotations of the New Testament for many, many years now, going back to the 1920s. And just in Latin alone, the number of quotations that these fathers have of the New Testament has reached over a million quotations. Now here's the point. We've got uh, 7,941 verses in the New Testament. So just think, 8,000 verses in the New Testament. And we have over a million quotations of the New Testament by these church fathers. Most quotations are about the length of a verse. So that means almost every verse is quoted many, many, many times over in the writings of the church fathers. So if we wiped all the rest of this data out, we'd still have uh, the ability to reconstruct the entire New Testament many times over just from the uh, writings of the Church Fathers. It's incredible. Uh, now, let me, you know, I'm giving you one half of the evidence. Let me talk to you about the other side of the evidence, and that is the average classical work, the average classical Greco-Roman author. The average classical Greek writer has less than 20 copies of his works still in existence. Uh, in fact, that's a very generous number. It's usually about two or three, but this is the number I've used when I've debated some people. And you stack those up, they'll be maybe about four feet high, somewhere around here. You stack the New Testament high, uh, uh, how tall, how do you think that stack's going to be? Not counting the quotations of the Church Fathers, I have no idea how to quantify that. Just these manuscripts and versions. Well, let's take a look. This gives you a comparative chart. The New Testament keeps growing. The classical text is just standing there. A little more. That's actually not to scale. I, I got tired of making the stacks of the New Testament. Multiply that by about eight. And the, the size of it actually is, uh, last estimates I came up with is over 6,500 feet. More than a mile high. Far more than a mile high. That's unbelievable. 
So you're, you're somebody who's working on, say, Herodotus or Livy or Suetonius or uh, one of these classical writers, and you're working on a stack of manuscripts that you can put on your desk. Or you're a New Testament textual critic and you're working on uh, just Paul's letters. And we have almost 800 manuscripts just of Paul's letters in Greek alone, plus thousands in other languages. And then the quotations of the Church Father. It's just never ending. So what New Testament scholars suffer from is an embarrassment of riches. And what we've had to do is we've had to sort through the data as efficiently as we can and find out what are the, what's the evidence that tells us this comes closest to the original. So we usually go back to the earliest manuscripts, but those that were copied in a very careful copying stream. Now just to compare this with uh, some famous Greco-Roman historians and biographers, Pliny the Elder, uh, we I think we have 27 copies of his writings. He writes in about the first century AD. We're waiting 700 years before we see the first one. Plutarch. Uh, we've got to, about 200 copies of Plutarch, if I'm not mistaken. And he's, again, contemporaneous with all this. And we're waiting 800 years before the, we see the first one. Josephus, who wrote, uh, among other works, The Antiquities of the Jews and the Jewish War, he's the great historian of Israel in the first century, lived from A.D. 37 to 100. And Josephus uh, wrote about Jesus, and he wrote about John the Baptist, and he wrote about um, James, the brother of the Lord. Uh, all of this is in Antiquities of the Jews, book 18. That book was copied more than any other book that Josephus wrote because Christians wanted to copy that book out. We have five copies of it. We have a grand total of 20 copies of all of Josephus' writings, and they're all uh, not, not entirely complete. Polybius, we're waiting 1,200 years before we get a single shred of documentation from him. Pausanias, who wrote the geography of ancient Greece 1,400 years before we get even one manuscript. Herodotus, who uh, was one of the great historians of the ancient world, Herodotus and Thucydides were considered to be the, the fathers of historiography and how history should be written. And Luke patterned his writings after these men. He's writing in the 5th century BC. We're waiting 1,500 years before we get more than just a couple of small scraps of what Herodotus had to say. And Xenophon and his Hellenica, another ancient historian, we're waiting 1,800 years before we get anything more than just a couple of small scraps. And here's, let's compare that to the New Testament. If that were the case, where we were waiting 1,800 years before we get anything that's more than a couple of small scraps of what the original New Testament said, that would be like waiting until about the time that the Wright brothers invented the airplane before we even had heard of the New Testament. Isn't that remarkable? We've got stuff that's massive compared to that. But so far I've, I've compared the numbers of the New Testament with the dates and numbers of the Greco-Roman stuff. So let's look at the, the dates for the New Testament as well. And I'm going to talk to you briefly about the oldest New Testament uh, manuscript, which is fragmentary. Uh, but then we'll talk about uh, some other early manuscripts and what they contribute. Uh, I want to talk to you about the discovery of P52, uh, or this is also known as the John Rylands Papyrus 457. This is at Manchester University in uh, the center of England. In, I want to set a stage for you, though. In 1844, here's, here's the fragment. In 1844, a fellow by the name of F.C. Bauer, or Ferdinand Christian Bauer, uh, had published in what's known as the Tübinger Jahrbuch, which is a, a journal that came out of Tübingen, Germany, uh, kind of a radical way to look at the New Testament. He applied Hegelian dialectic uh, to uh, the New Testament, and he was the first to ever do that. He had actually studied under Professor Hegel at Tübingen. Hegelian dialectic, you know, this is a Friday night and it's hot. You don't want to hear these big fancy words, so let me just tell you what Hegelian dialectic is. You've all heard of thesis, antithesis, synthesis, you know. Like you got, you got a son, he's got long hair, here's the thesis. No, you're going to have short hair. Antithesis, no, it's going to be long hair. Synthesis, he has long hair, so that's, that's how it is in Dallas anyway. So. Anyway, uh, Bauer applied this to the New Testament. And what he came up with was, he said, we have Peter's form of Christianity, which is very Jewish, Paul's, which is very Gentile, and then we have John and the book of Acts, which are kind of an amalgamation of the two. And he said, that can't possibly have happened 
for many, many decades. And so he dated John's Gospel to 170, long after John would have died, and the book of Acts at about the same time. Now, if that's the case, then whatever John's Gospel is saying about uh, Jesus, it's certainly not written by an eyewitness. It comes much later, and that's a way that Bauer could simply dismiss anything that was historical in it. Well, 90 years later, 1934, there was uh, a, a newly minted doctoral uh, student by the name of Colin H. Roberts, C.H. Roberts, and he had been assigned the task of uh, going through a bunch of papyrus scraps that had recently come from Egypt. The previous man who was working on them had just died, and so Roberts was assigned the task to go through these. And uh, he, was, he, he was a classic scholar. He comes across this fragment that's no bigger than the palm of my hand. It was actually about the size of a credit card, three and a half inches tall by two and a half inches wide. And he looked at it and he said, this, this may be a biblical text. And that's this manuscript here. Uh, it was written on both sides. Now, the very fact that it was written on both sides meant that it was from a codex, not a scroll. Scrolls were always written on the inside. And papyrus fibers, the way they put papyrus together, the ancient form of paper, is they take these papyrus uh, shoots and they beat them down, and then you got these fibers that they lay across this way, and then they put fibers on the back uh, that would be uh, vertical to it. And so uh, uh, then they'd uh, smash that together and it would naturally glue together, and that was, it was pretty, pretty decent paper. It lasts better than our paper today. But you'd only write on the horizontal fibers on the inside. With the invention of the codex, now you could write on both sides, and all Christian documents are on a or all New Testament documents are on a codex, which raises a really interesting question: Why did the Christians? They didn't invent the codex form, but they were the ones to popularize it. We still don't know why, but we know this: that in the first five centuries of the Christian era, eighty percent of all Christian documents were written on a codex and 20% of all non-Christian documents were written on a codex. By about AD 500, the whole world had caught up. It was the first time, and I think the only time, that Christians have been ahead of the technological curve. <laughs> you know, we're, we're usually about 50 years behind times on this. But when he saw that there was writing on the back, he said, this is a Christian document. He knew this immediately. What he discovered is it was John chapter 18, verses 31 through 33 on the front side, which you see, and the verses 37 and 38 on the back side. He said it also looked very early. And so he sent photographs of it to the three leading papyrologists in Europe at the time, the scholars who uh, examined these ancient papyri that had just been coming out of Egypt since the late 1890s. And uh, each one of them wrote back to him and said, this manuscript should not be dated any later than AD 150, and it should be dated much closer to AD 100. All three of them said this. A fourth one examined it. And he said, no, I disagree. I think it could be as early as the 90s. Now, most scholars today date John's Gospel in the 90s. One wag said, this papyrus was written when the original of John's Gospel, the ink was not yet dried. So uh, it's very, very early. It's very close to the time of John's Gospel. That's a remarkable thing. Here's, here's what Robert's discovery did. The scrap of papyrus sent two tons of European scholarship to the flames. Uh, philosophical constructs are one thing, evidence is another, and it just reminds me of this saying, an ounce of evidence is worth a pound of presumption. I'm going to give you several ounces of evidence tonight, but that's uh, part of how we'll look at this. So, today, every New Testament scholar would say John's Gospel was written in the first century. Uh, some of us would say it may be written as early as the 60s. Well, not just that particular manuscript, but within 150 years of the completion of the New Testament, we have over 40% of all the verses of the New Testament found in these manuscripts. In the same amount of time for classical literature, you have zero evidence, nothing. Within 300 years, we have the whole New Testament uh, not only uh, multiplied over and over again, but compare that to classical, nothing. You're at, waiting an average of at least 500 years before you get any copies from classical writings that exist. The changes that could have happened in those first 500 years where we don't have those manuscripts anymore, we have no idea what could have happened. But it's, it's vast compared to what we have with the New Testament. So here's another way to think about this. And I think this is very important. Going back to, to Richard Bentley and his 
is looking at these manuscripts where he's saying, you know, some of these manuscripts, uh, I can tell just by what they have to say, whether the, that reading, that variant goes back earlier or not. And then by dating the manuscripts, that's another way to do it. So what scholars do is they look at the internal evidence, what a scribe would likely to be, to have written, to change it, what the author would have likely uh, written, and they look at the external evidence, the witnesses, the manuscripts, the dates, the church fathers, this kind of thing. And what's significant is, since these papyri, the earliest manuscripts we have ever discovered for the New Testament, since they have been discovered in the last 150 years, not a single new reading, not a single new variant has commended itself to scholars so that they print this as the text of the New Testament in that place. Not one word has changed because of these papyri. Now what I mean is, the papyri are very, very important. But what they do is they confirm some manuscripts that were complete Bibles in the fourth century that we uh, we still have one of these that's uh, that's a complete New Testament. We have three others that are almost complete New Testaments. Uh, and those manuscripts were very, very accurate. And the papyri tend to confirm this wording or this wording, but they don't give us any new variant that we'd never seen before. This is a really important point because what it means is when it comes to reconstructing the text of the New Testament, we have today our critical texts. You have the text of the New Testament above the line, and then you have the footnotes with the textual variants, just like a John Mills text had. And I can tell you with a great deal of assurance, the original text is somewhere on the page, either above the line or below the line. When it comes to classical texts, we have no idea if it's above the line, below the line, or somewhere else. In fact, to do classical textual criticism, Scholars constantly have to use what's called conjectural emendation. That is, coming up with a reading, a wording, that is not found in any manuscripts, because all the manuscripts are corrupt and they know it, and they, and they can't trust them. There's not a single place in the New Testament where we have to follow any conjecture at this stage. Now, maybe someday people will come up and be more creative and say, although thousands have been suggested, not one of them has committed itself. Not one. In the 500 years where conjectures have been suggested, and not one of these uh, early papyri that has a reading that's not found in these other great manuscripts has uh, commended itself for being authentic. That's significant. Within a hundred years of the New Testament, we have as many as a dozen papyri that were produced. Uh, altogether, we have now 129. The most recent one was just discovered a few weeks ago. Okay, so that gives you some of this background. I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you. Probably you're happy you're videoing this because it's, way, it's just like drinking from a fire hose, isn't it? So. <laughs> But has the Bible been translated and retranslated so many times that we don't know what it originally said? Here's another way to look at it, comparing it to the King James Bible. Published in May of 1611, based on seven manuscripts. This is just the New Testament. The earliest manuscript was from the 11th century. So here it is, the 17th century, going back to the 11th century, 600 years. Uh, now, more than 400 years later, we have almost a thousand times as many manuscripts in Greek alone, the earliest of which go back almost a thousand years earlier. That's remarkable. And the remarkable thing, the really remarkable thing, is that the King James Bible is based on a text that doesn't have that many differences from these more ancient manuscripts. It's a very slow process of change. I'll talk to you about that here in a minute. So this is the conclusion of my first point, and I said this is going to take almost all the time tonight, as time goes on, we're not getting farther and farther away from the original, like Dan Brown would like to suggest. We're getting closer and closer to the original text. Okay, secondly, the quality of variants, or the, the kind of variants, what kinds are there? Well, this is going to be much simpler to go through. 99% make virtually no difference at all. 99% of that 400,000 text of variants, they make virtually no difference at all. For example, there's differences in spelling that you get. Oh, sorry. A little better. But you know what I meant, right? <laughs> ancient scribes were no better spellers than we are today. In fact, ancient authors were no better spellers than we are today. In John's Gospel, in the space of eight verses, he spells the verb opened, which it's parsed, conjugated exactly the same way, three different ways in the space of eight verses. Who does that? My, my brother is a terrible speller. He wrote out a check for me one time where he misspelled his own name, and I wonder if that was on purpose because it was a little bit difficult to catch. But uh, nevertheless, 
Uh, the ancients didn't even have dictionaries. There, there was no standard on how to spell back then, so you get a lot of creative spellings. All right, let me give you some examples of uh, other kinds. The name John, for example, in Greek is spelled Ioannes or Ioannes. It sounds exactly like it's got two ends in the middle or not. You've got the movable new, which is the end at an end of a word, which is added when the following word starts with a vowel. Just like we have in English, a book, an apple. Or I understand that the southwestern bulldogs say a book, a apple, right? But you guys are a little brighter than that, so. For the Greek definite article, the word the in Greek, we have 20,000 of them in the New Testament. I did my master's thesis on when the does not occur in the New Testament. I did my doctoral dissertation on when it does occur. Uh, these two works, both of them have been published, would cure the most hopeless insomnia. Uh, and I still don't know exactly why the is used. But here's the interesting thing. It's used with proper names. So remember, I, I you probably forgot this, but in John 4, 1, there's a text referring when the Lord knew or when Jesus knew. Literally, it's when the Lord knew or when the Jesus knew. It's never translated the Jesus in English or most other modern languages because it doesn't make any sense. We still don't know why the is used with proper names. The Mary and the Joseph took Jesus from Jerusalem when he was a young boy. Uh, we have those kinds of statements that we're scholars are trying to figure out. But obviously it hasn't impacted any major issue theologically. So, putting all this together, plus word order differences, I'm going to show you a little experiment that I did. Greek is a highly inflected language. That means you have the endings that change. Uh, you can put in any order, Jesus loves Mary. It can be Mary loves Jesus, uh, Mary Jesus loves, Jesus uh, Mary loves, loves Jesus Mary, any order you want. And the ending is going to tell you what the subject is and what the object is. And so I decided to try an experiment with how many ways you can say John loves Mary in Greek. What we're dealing with is proper names, where you can add or not have the article. We're dealing with different spellings for both John and Mary. And we're dealing with the same word loves every single time. But we're also dealing with different word order. And uh, you, you want to take notes on this, because this will show up on the exam. Eight different ways to say John. I had to put this in Greek, otherwise in English, every time I say John loves Mary. Every one of these is translated, John loves Mary. And here's another eight ways you can say John loves Mary in Greek. And another eight, and more, and more. 96 ways you can say John loves Mary in Greek, and every single time it is translated, John loves Mary. That's what it means. Now, with conjunctions that are often untranslated, uh, there are a few of them that just, men is a, is a conjunction that means indeed, or like John indeed loves Mary. Usually it's not even translated, though. So we're not even sure exactly what it means. So you add that, and now we've got, I hope you appreciate this. This took me eight hours to put together. <laughs> Spent a whole day on this. You, you got all those while, while I'm putting them up here so you remember them all? Absolutely. 384 ways to say John loves Mary. It's never Jim. It's never... Uh, somebody besides Mary, and it's always the same word for John. The emphasis is a little bit different, but that's it. That's it. 384 ways to say John loves Mary in Greek. In fact, there's more ways to do it. Uh, I, I decided 384, that's enough. To, that, that should impress you. Um, there's other legitimate word orders that would swell the numbers to over 500, and if you put in a different verb for loves, now it mushrooms the numbers to nearly 1,200 ways to say John loves Mary in Greek. Well, what was the point of this exercise? It's just this. Here's what Bart Ehrman says. We could go on nearly forever talking about specific places in which the text of the New Testament came to be changed, either accidentally or intentionally. The examples are not just in the hundreds, but in the thousands. He's absolutely right, and almost all of them would bore us to tears, and no textual critic on the planet discusses these because they don't make any difference at all. We are trying to talk about the important texture variants, not the myriads of ones that don't even show up in an apparatus that just don't, they don't change anything. The vast majority of texture variants can't even be translated. So, um, oops, sorry, 
Here's the point, though. If we can say John loves Mary over a thousand times in Greek without substantially changing the meaning, the number of textual variants, 400,000, is meaningless. What really counts is the nature of these variants. So let's real quickly look at what that involves. The smallest group of variants, those that are meaningful and viable, and viable means they have a good chance of going back to the original being authentic, less than 1% of all textual variants. In fact, I peg it at less than one-fourth of one percent. The difference between how Bart Ehrman and I would construct the, the text in the New Testament would not be one-fourth of one percent. It would be, I think, a hundredth of a percent, something like that. It's, it ends up being uh, maybe a couple dozen places where we're going to have differences. That's it. Our biggest differences are in the interpretation of the text, not in what the text actually says. So that's remarkable to realize. You get those 400,000 textual variants, only one-fourth of one percent affect any meaning. I'm going to real quickly just mention the two biggest textual problems. These are often cited by skeptics to say, look, here's, look at this kind of a, a textual problem in, in uh, the, the New Testament. The text is terribly corrupt. And these are just a couple examples. No, they're not just a couple examples. These are the two biggest examples by far. At the end of Mark's Gospel, and in uh, John chapter 7, 53 through 8, 11, the story of the woman caught in adultery in the long ending of Mark's Gospel. Both of them are 12 verses long. The next longest textual variant is two verses long. So these are not typical in any sense. We have no more than about two dozen variants that involve one or two verses. And the next one is part of a verse after that. And the most common kind of a textual variant is a single letter, two letter differences, something like that. Uh, movable new, which I told you about, that's actually the most common variant we have. So Mark 16, that's the passage about picking up snakes, drinking poison, not dying, this kind of thing, those last 12 verses. And uh, here I think we have a picture of a church in uh, uh, West Virginia that practices the snake handling. You see this poor guy that lost his arm from not having enough faith when he did it one time. And Harold, aren't you the guy here on the right? That's me, yeah. You mean on the left? Yeah, okay. I'm the guy running out the door. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> um, you can, if you Google snake handlers, you, you can see some videos of this stuff. It's really scary. I had some students uh, just last year who went into Tennessee and visited a snake handler pastor. And I, 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 I'm deathly afraid of snakes. I, I don't want to have anything to do with these things at all. I never would have done that. But it, they, this, these guys, uh, two students went and visited this pastor. And uh, they said, where do you keep your snakes? He said, right here. He's sitting in a chair. He pulls one out that's just coiled up underneath the chair. A rattlesnake. I would have passed out. This is just too much. <laughs> this is how some people think is what Christianity looks like. Uh, those 12 verses almost surely were added after the New Testament was written. The oldest manuscripts don't have them. Uh, church fathers talk about those two passages. Ancient church fathers uh, who say, uh, they are not found in the majority of manuscripts. I found them in almost no manuscripts at all. This is in the early 4th and late 4th century. By the 6th century, they were in about half the manuscripts. And the reason is because Mark's gospel, without these 12 verses, ends this way. Uh, the angel told the women to uh, go and tell the disciples to meet Jesus in Galilee, and they did nothing for they were afraid. Period. It's a downer. But it may be Mark's intention. Because what Mark is trying to do is get his readers to enter into the story themselves. And basically, I think what he's asking is, what are you going to do with Jesus? If you want to see him in his glory, you must accept him in his suffering. And you yourself must pick up your cross and carry it daily. And so Mark uses an ancient technique of an open-ended conclusion to get the reader to be involved in the story rather than just as a, a distant uh, reader of it, observer of it. And so, early scribes are saying, wait a minute, there's no resurrection appearance. Jesus was raised from the dead. But there's no appearance by Jesus in um, the way Mark ended it. So they had to add this appearance. And this is not the only ending. There's five endings that were added. This is just the one that became the most popular. When you have five different endings to a gospel, that tells you that something is amiss. It tells you that there's this kind of textual disruption it means that the early scribes weren't satisfied with what was there. If this was already there, scribes wouldn't have changed it. Since this was not there originally, they're, they're putting this in and other kinds of endings. It doesn't fit Mark's vocabulary, it doesn't fit his style, it doesn't 
read, uh, read uh, what the church fathers speak of, and it's not found in the oldest manuscripts, uh, I'd have to say it's just simply not authentic. But what doctrines does it affect? Nothing. Unless you're a snake handler in West Virginia. But apart from that, nothing. And John 7, 53 through 8, 11 is what I'd say is my favorite passage that's not in the Bible. It's the story of the woman caught in adultery. Uh, it's a great passage about Jesus uh, forgiving an adulterous woman. And uh, I think that it is largely true historically. And one of my students recently was able to demonstrate more than likely that uh, he got this published in a major journal, a European journal, that this story was in, in a truncated form is what Luke had access to. And it ended up on his cutting floor. He chose not to put it into his gospel. But it actually made its way into a number of manuscripts at the end of Luke chapter 21. This story about Jesus forgiving this adulterous woman and the Pharisees ready to stone her and then he says, the one who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And they peel off from the oldest to the younger, and they drop their stones and go away. And Jesus says to the woman, where are your accusers? They're gone. Um, and uh, then Jesus says, uh, and neither do I condemn you. And uh, she, she goes on her way. Um, but this story was conflated between a story that was circulated in the East and in the West, and by the third century got put together. But in the first eight centuries of copying, we have only one manuscript that has it, only one. And 20% of all of our manuscripts don't have this story in it at all. But where it is found is in different locations. And again, when you have a text that's floating or changes, that normally tells you, that kind of textual disruption tells you it's not authentic. It's found in this place. It's found in two other places in John 7. It's found at the end of the Gospel of John. It's found between Luke and John, and it's found after Luke 21, 38. It's, just, it's all over the map. And so that tells you that it's a passage that scribes wanted to put into the Bible, and it finally was able to settle in this place. But it's probably not authentic. It's certainly not what John wrote. It doesn't fit his vocabulary style. Uh, and historically, uh, most of it actually is authentic, but I don't think that the whole thing is. But I had to tell you that because I wanted to, I, when I give these lectures, I try to be as honest as I possibly can on both sides of the fence, because Christians are always horrified when they hear this. Skeptics are always happy to hear it, and this is what the evidence really looks like altogether. And I'll just list two other textual problems just to show you the kind of typical, these aren't even typical, these are very, very important textual problems. These fit into that one-fourth of one percent of all the textual problems that are meaningful and viable. Mark 9, 29, after the disciples go out and they try to cast out some particularly pesky demons, they come back and they say, Lord, we can't cast these demons out. And he said, this kind can only be cast out by prayer or by prayer and fasting. I put and fasting in brackets. It's not found in the oldest manuscripts. This would be the only place in the New Testament where fasting is a requirement for exorcisms. And so I'm sure just by looking at me, you can realize that I, I go with a shorter reading here. Um, you know, I don't want to have fasting to be part of this. But uh, actually, it's not found in the oldest manuscripts. Fasting was something that we know in the church, starting in, a few centuries later, became a normal thing that they did. But it wasn't simply, it wasn't uh, done as often in the earlier centuries. So probably due to, to that kind of a, a reason. But nevertheless, if you're involved in exorcisms, hedge your bet, pray, and fast. That's a good idea. <laughs> Revelation 13, 18, the last passage that I wanted to list here, then we'll go on to our final question. Let the one who has insight calculate the beast's number. This is the Antichrist number. For it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. We all know that's the number of the Antichrist. doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not. You've heard of the number 666 in a context like this. The problem is, there was a manuscript discovered in 1843 that had the number of the beast as 616. And this manuscript, uh, it was what's called a palimpsest. It's, it's uh, from the 400s, very early manuscript, and it has ended up being one of the absolute most important manuscripts we have from the book of Revelation. It was scraped, it was written on parchment, and all it was scraped about eight centuries later, and somebody else wrote on top of it because they didn't want to go and kill another sheep and make more parchment leaves, so let's just cannibalize an older parchment manuscript that's sitting on this shelf and collecting dust. And so they scraped off the letters as best they could. 
and nobody could read it very well until a German scholar got by the name of Constantine von Tischendorf came to the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris and spent two years as a young man with incredible eyesight and was able to decipher 99% of this text in 1843 and 1844. And when he got to Revelation 13, 18, it clearly said the number of the beast is 616. Well, that's what I was told. And so I went to the Bibliothèque Nationale in 2009, and I had got permission to examine the same manuscript. And uh, so I spent a day with it. It was, it was like Christmas for me to spend time with a manuscript like this. And uh, 616 is one of the clearest places in the whole manuscript, because there was no text written directly on top of it. And so it was very clear that this scribe originally wrote 616. But that was the only manuscript. Even though extraordinarily important, 616 uh, was uh, just in one manuscript. Until 1999, when at Oxford University they published 17 papyri, and one of them was a papyrus uh, that had 26 different fragments spread out over nine chapters in the book of Revelation, and one postage, uh, postage stamp size fragment was right here at Revelation 13. And uh, I had the opportunity to look at that fragment in 2002, just uh, three years after it was published. And uh, it was in, a, in its own glass case, but it had white paper inside of it, and Revelation 13, 18 was on the back side. And so uh, they had to slice open the case so I could actually look at this uh, very famous textual problem. And I said, how many people have seen this uh, since this was published? And they said, counting you? Yeah, one. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I guess scholars just don't like to look at the manuscripts as much, but that's, that's what <coughs> our center does, is we go and photograph these things. So, I looked at this under a magnifying glass and under a microscope, and it sure enough said 616 uh, in the original hand, not changed in this papyrus, which happens to be the oldest manuscript we have for Revelation 1318. Now, we have one of the most important manuscripts that says 616, and the oldest one that says that, even with that, and it, it, it would take a long time to explain what the issues are for this textual problem, most scholars would say, no, 666 is the number of the beast. 616, that's the neighbor of the beast. He lives just a few doors down. You know, so <laughs> so uh, that's where most of them are. But at the same time, here's what I would say. This is one of these passages that this does affect me. It's a viable textual problem, and it's, it's one of that one-fourth of one percent of all textual variants. And yet, I know of no theological seminary, no Bible college, no church, no denomination, uh, no theological institute that puts in its doctrinal statement the following. We believe in the virgin birth of Christ. We believe in the deity of Christ. We believe in the resurrection of Christ. And we believe that the number of the beast is 666. It may be important, but it's not that important. Now, I'm a consultant for four different Bible translations, and I was the senior New Testament editor for the Net Bible and the textual critic for it. And in my uh, more uh, sinful days, I thought, you know, maybe the next edition of this Bible, we should just put the number of the beasts as 616, just to mess with the crowds, you know. Uh, if we did that, that would send about seven tons of popular Christian literature to the flames. <laughs> if you Googled 666, you're going to see some of the loony stuff on the internet. People come up with weird ideas on that one. But nevertheless, I don't know what the original of Revelation 13, 18 is. Uh, I go back and forth between these two. I'm not certain about it, but it doesn't affect the essentials of my faith. That's the kind of issue we're wrestling with. So finally, what theological beliefs depend on textually suspect passages? Well, going back to, uh, uh, oops. Sorry, we, we, uh, we passed that one. Mark 9.29, Revelation 13.18, and now we have Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. Let's see if we'll show up. Here we go. Sir Lee Tebing speaks to Sophie. He's speaking about the Council of Nicaea in AD 325, where they defined what they meant by the deity of Christ. He said, My dear, Tebing declared, until that moment in history, Jesus was viewed by his followers as a mortal prophet, a great and powerful man, but a man, nonetheless, a mortal. I think Da Vinci Code is a great read. Uh, when I got it, I read it to my boys. We went camping up in Arkansas, up from Dallas, uh, 
about eight hour drive and I, I, my, my voice got completely hoarse going all the way up and all the way down reading for eight hours each way. We uh, went out in the, in the woods and camped. It was, it was fun to read. Um, and I, I love a good novel. But uh, that's all this is, is a novel. When this book came out, uh, two of our boys were still in college. The two that I went with were, were out of college. But when we came out, these two that were in college went to some pretty decent schools in this country. Uh, Georgia Tech, University of Texas, and they had professors at their schools say, finally, here's a book that proves that Christianity is rooted in mythology. And I'm thinking, really? You're going to say that? What's the evidence for this? And they point to this kind of thing, that the deity of Christ wasn't invented until AD 325, and Constantine the Great, the emperor, is the one who invented it. Well, remember how I told you that uh, an ounce of evidence is worth a pound of presumption. I'm going to show you just an ounce of evidence again. This is P66, dated about AD 175, and this is um, the first page of this uh, manuscript. It's the Gospel of John, and it has John 1 1, or John chapter 1. It says at the top of the Gospel according to John, read along with me if you would in John 1 1. <laughs> Where it says, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now I know you've never heard those words before, because this is a manuscript that is prior to AD 325. We don't have, you know, the, where they didn't affirm the deity of Christ. The reality is, none of those passages that speak of the deity of Christ that the church has always depended on have changed. There are some later ones that the church later on depended on, but not in the early formulations at the Council of Nicaea. Not a single passage that they thought affirmed the deity of Christ was changed from the original. That's remarkable. And so, uh, again, I'd say an ounce of evidence is worth a pound, a pound of presumption. Here, this manuscript is written about 150 years before the Council of Nicaea. Now, unless Constantine was maybe 175 years old, which he wasn't at that time, uh, then uh, he, you can't say that he invented the deity of Christ, that it was invented in the 4th century. Dan Brown was basing his evidence on a, a novel written by three British guys, and they actually had the gall to say, and they tried to present their stuff not as a novel, but as true history, uh, where they said there's not a single New Testament manuscript prior to the 4th century. Not one. Well, there are between 48 and 61 manuscripts in Greek alone prior to the 4th century uh, of the New Testament. And the reason we don't know the exact date between 48 and 61 is because some of them are right on the cusp between data between 3rd and 4th century. We're not exactly sure, but there's at least 48 of them. So they were just wrong. Every single manuscript of John's Gospel, no matter the date or the language, says virtually the same thing in John 1. Jesus is unequivocally called God. That's, that's pretty significant, very significant, in fact. The same can be said for the major passages that are from Christ's deity, his virgin birth, his sinlessness, his death on a cross, his bodily resurrection, and his second coming. Now, let me conclude. Bart Ehrman, in the paperback version of his book, Misquoting Jesus, that came out uh, the summer after the, the original hardcover book came out, there was a section in the paperback book that has now been taken out. Uh, it's an appendix. And it was questions from the editors of the book to Ehrman. And they asked him basically to summarize what he says in the book. They thought this would help sell copies. Why do you believe these core tenets of Christian orthodoxy to be in jeopardy based on the scribal errors you discovered in the biblical manuscripts? Notice, why do you believe, not do you believe? And these core tenets of Christian orthodoxy, the essential beliefs of Christians, why do you think they're in jeopardy? They wanted him just to summarize the contents of his book. And when they put it this way, notice what he said. Essential Christian beliefs are not affected by textual variants in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. That's astounding. They're not affected at all. He recognizes that he couldn't prove his case that essentials of the Christian faith are not affected. So what I would say, in conclusion, is this. Exactly what Ehrman has said here. Essential Christian beliefs are not affected by the textual variants uh, for the New Testament. 
Do we have the exact original text of the New Testament in our, in our translations today? No, I think there are probably some differences. They keep changing. Maybe in the next hundred years we'll change maybe a, another dozen places. They change very, very little just based on more research. But are all essentials intact? Absolutely. What about the particulars? Over 99% of those, 99 and 3 fourths percent of those particulars are also intact. We know what the Bible said originally. Right, thank you very much. I guess we have a little time for Q&A. You want to stand up and stretch for a minute or two? It's been, it's been a long lecture. Or not. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, in, in terms of the, the Old Testament, are these same techniques uh, used to investigate the validity of the Old Testament? Uh, can you just speak to that? Yeah, the, in, in terms of how they do textual criticism? Yes, sir. Yeah, th this is standard stuff, although for every uh, piece of literature there are different uh, historical traditions that we have to wrestle with. And for the Old Testament we have some different kinds of problems. Uh, namely, we don't have early Hebrew manuscripts except for the Dead Sea Scrolls. We're waiting until about AD 900 before we get our next one, or 800, 850, right around there. Um, but uh, we do have Greek copies of the Old Testament that are very, very early. And, uh, and we have copies of the Old Testament in other languages that are, are much earlier than the Hebrew, so it's an unusual situation for them. But uh, at the same time, the, the, these principles of looking at internal evidence, what a scribe would likely be to do, and the external evidence, tracing through as much as we possibly can the history of the transmission, and which manuscripts are to be preferred, those kinds of things, that's, that's pretty standard fare across the board. In the passage over there on John, uh, I forgot what the two Greek manuscripts were, but in one of them I forgot to make one of the most uh, authoritative or considered authoritative is just, uh, space for that. Uh, you know, we call it an adultery. And Actually, that's not true. You're thinking of the Mark 16 passage where you have a gap. Is where? Uh, Mark 16. Mark 16. Yeah, there's no, no gaps uh, for Codex Sinaiticus or Vaticanus at John 8. They don't, they don't have any room for the, this passage. I was thinking it was a gap. But my understanding was a gap for the a John passage there. I thought there was some, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I was thinking there was a gap left out for, for I forget which manuscript it was. Yeah, yeah it's, it's Codex Vaticanus that has a gap at the end of Mark's Gospel. Okay. Uh, it has an entire column that's blank. And there's three other times where that manuscript, that's probably our most important uh, biblical manuscript. It's in the Vatican, as you might guess, uh, and uh, it's written about AD 350. Very, very carefully done. Uh, some think it was one of the original Bibles that Emperor Constantine commissioned to be produced. Uh, but Constantine did not have any impact on what the Bible should look like, uh, in particular because he commissioned Eusebius uh, who had already wrestled with all those issues long before he'd ever had any contact with Constantine. But um, uh, Codex Vaticanus has three places in the Old Testament where it's, it's a three-column manuscript. And uh, in three places in the Old Testament, it leaves a whole column blank. This is the only place in the New Testament. But in two of those three Old Testament places, the reason for the blank column is because, because of a shift in genre to the next piece of literature. So you have, for example, at the end of uh, uh, the book of Daniel, you get into the New Testament next, and it's, you, you didn't want to put it on the same page. Uh, in one of these books, it shifts from uh, history to the Psalms, and so you didn't want to put those on the same page, so they left the whole column blank and moved on to the next one. Uh, for Mark's Gospel, uh, the, the column is, the blank column is simply not nearly big enough to allow for those last 12 verses to be put there. And so it's rather doubtful that that's the reason. Uh, I think the reason is that the ancestor of Vaticanus, uh, by the time you get to the fourth century, you can make these codices very, very large. This manuscript is it's almost eight inches thick. Uh, there, there's a facsimile that they've made in 1999. There's 450 of these in the world. And every one was signed by Pope John Paul II on Christmas Day, 1999. Uh, and it, it's thick. It's a magnificent facsimile.
But um, what, uh, uh, let's see, I lost my place here, so I was talking about Mark 16. Well, anyway, the, the Mark, what, what I was saying was they didn't have that capacity to make such large codices at this, in earlier centuries, so they could have maybe just the Gospels. And by the time we get to the fourth century, now they can figure out how to make books so they can incorporate the whole Bible. And so I take it that probably the scribe of Vaticanus used an earlier manuscript that just had the Gospels, but I think the order of the Gospels was called the Western order, where you put the apostles first and non-apostles second. We have several manuscripts that have this. It would be Matthew, John, Luke, and Mark last. Now, if he did that, and the scribe of Vaticanus simply kept the order, but not the reasons for it, that gap at the end of Mark meant, originally, the next book is Acts. And uh, that's a shift from John. So. But it has nothing to do with uh, the last 12 verses. Yeah, go ahead. I was just thinking with all the popular scholarship and debates and how much Christianity, of course, the scriptures have been analyzed, that same attention was done to other sacred texts, whether it was the Quran or Buddhist uh, sacred scriptures. Can you imagine if, if that same kind of uh, attention was focused on those different writings, and look at how much Christianity's had to deal with it over the last several hundred years. Mm -hmm. you know, like I said, only 99% of it's relatively intact, how it's weathered all those storms. Can you imagine if we apply those same critiques to other uh, oh, they, texts? Can you imagine they, what the, uh, that would be? Yeah, there, there has been some work on this. Um, uh, the, the Hinduism uh, documents, uh, the Bhagavad Gita, and, and uh, uh, so, uh, so there was one of the Hindu documents that I spent some time in, in where they just, they, they've got so many gaps in their tradition. Um, the, the Buddhist uh, documents for the teachings of the compassionate Buddha and this kind of thing, um, they, they say, we don't have anywhere close to what the New Testament scholars have. We are waiting hundreds of years, perhaps well over a thousand years before we get anything, and we just have no idea if it goes back to the original. Uh, so they, they, they recognize that. Now, the Quran, they claim something kind of different. But for the Quran, we have a very strong certainty that it does not go back to the original. And the reason is because uh, uh, Khalif Uthman, who headed up Islam about 50 years after uh, Muhammad died, gathered up all the extant copies of the Quran and destroyed them and said, here's the one official one that we're going to make copies from. And there were a lot of differences among them. And uh, this is just a historical record. but. The, the official Islam doctrine is that all the copies from that point on were identical, but they aren't. And scholars outside of the Islamic faith are beginning to examine the Quran, and they're discovering these. And I, I've looked at some of these manuscripts where there's erasures, there's changes, they don't say the same thing. And even uh, one or two manuscripts have been found to be pre-Khalif uh, Uthman manuscripts that are palimpsests. They were scraped over and the same Quran was written on top of it. But now with our scientific technology we can read that under text and uh, find out what it actually says. So, and, and it is turning out to be a little bit different in some places. Yeah. You had a question? I do. I, did, the, did the church through some, by some political agenda reject <coughs> some gospels that should be in the Bible? No. Is there some conspiracy to... No. no. What, what we're dealing with when it comes to the Gospels is the church for, from a very early period uh, recognized inherently these four Gospels that we have in, in our New Testament. There was another one that they uh, recognized as very significant called the Gospel to the Hebrews. And um, that was uh, one that was probably written in the first century some scholars think that that was Matthew's gospel written in Aramaic or Hebrew that Matthew then also translated into Greek. Um, I, I don't know what to think about the gospel of the Hebrews. We don't have the, the evidence for it anymore. But apparently it was Orthodox and completely agreed with the others. But uh, when you get later on, you get these gospels, and what we start seeing in the second century is the names of these apocryphal gospels are actually put on there. So the Gospel of Thomas, written probably in between 120 and 140, the very first word of the Gospel of Thomas is Thomas. Uh, Thomas Didymus, you know, so, it's, so uh, 
Uh, you've got the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Mary, Gospel of Judas, these 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th century Gospels that explicitly name the author in the manuscript. You don't have that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And the reason you don't is because their authority was intrinsic. <coughs> they were not trying to commend themselves as these authors because it, they were written at a time when they were written to their own audiences, and so the audience knew who they were. And only when you found another gospel that, did you have to put a title on it. And the original titles was According to Matthew, According to Mark. Not even Gospel According to Matthew and Mark. And um, so those titles were added later, but the church also universally always called the Gospel of Matthew the Gospel of Matthew. They never called it the Gospel of Philip or something like that. It was, uh, Matthew was always the name. Same with Mark, Luke, and John. Now, the reason that you have these names in the manuscripts in the second century is precisely to give them instant credibility because they've got a catch-up game. These other Gospels are well known and so if you're, if you're creating a fabricated Gospel you want to put that Apostle's name in there prominently and of course the Gospel of Thomas is very ingenious. It says well, Thomas was given some secrets that Jesus told him privately, and so he knows stuff the rest of the apostles don't know. And that's a way to circumvent the fact that whatever's in Thomas was not in the other Gospels. That's why. You know, so it's, and, and so it's an ingenious uh, thing that uh, Thomas did. I mean, the, the, the author. Nobody thinks Thomas wrote it. Not a single person that I've ever heard of thinks that Thomas wrote it. But uh, the, the canonical Gospels would easily have been the first books to be accepted. And from the very earliest times that we have of, of the, uh, the great church, the Orthodox Church, not uh, groups like Marcy and other uh, heretics that didn't believe that Jesus was both man and God, they accepted all four of the Gospels and all 13 of Paul's letters, always. And those 18 books, or it was, sorry, that's, I guess that's 17 books, uh, plus Acts is 18, uh, 1 Peter is 19, Let's see, um, there's another one I forgot, that's the 20th one. But th th there were, by the end of the second century, at least 20 books were considered to be authoritative and nobody doubted those from that point on. But we don't have any record of anybody in the great church doubting these 17 books and Acts included in that 18. So uh, th these Gospels, there were, there were dozens of them. We have no idea how many were made. One of these uh, Muslim scholars says, well, there were 4,000 different Gospels that were circulating, and the church just rejected all these. No, if, if they came up with that number, I have no idea where they came up with it from. We don't have that kind of evidence. But what we do have is a criterion, and the, the fundamental criterion for the church accepting something as authoritative is, was it written by an apostle or an associate of an apostle? By definition, that has to be first century because John, the last apostle, died at the end of the first century. So, if it's not written in the first century, it never gets considered. And these other books never got considered by the great church. By some outcropping uh, areas, yes, they did, but every once in a while, but very, very rarely. Several years ago, there was a book published, uh, the title was something about the unpublished books of the Bible. Yeah. So, Mary and how reliable those? Well, those are, you, you have apocryphal books, and by apocryphal means it's, it's written by somebody, uh, it, it, apocrypha simply means hidden, and uh, we, we use that title to refer to these books that really weren't part of the original New Testament. Um, they're also called pseudepigraphical books, that means it's written by somebody other than who it's attributed to. But they, they, they run in two different uh, categories. One is they are outright heretical, trying to give a different picture of Jesus than what the, uh, the, the mainstream Christianity has always believed. This is what M.M. Al Azami was saying, and he's saying that mainstream Christianity just deliberately distorted these texts when there's no evidence that they did that. He was basing this entirely on what Bart Ehrman wrote. But um, the, the, most of them are heretical, they don't have a, a, an adequate view of Jesus or the Gospel. And the vast majority of them, this is really interesting, is they have nothing of historical value, in fact, typically nothing of history at all in them. The Gospel of Thomas, for example, has, it's 114 sayings of Jesus. And there's not a single city or place that's named, there's no geography mentioned, uh, there's no miracles that Jesus does in there. It's all talking head theology. 
which makes it much harder to date. When was the situation in which this was written? Well, in other words, it doesn't subject itself to historical verifiability like the Bible does. And as a Christian, this is where I've come to recognize that if God became man in time-space history, and part of the reason for this is to subject himself to historical investigation, that's the nature of the scriptures as well. The Bible is the only sacred text of any major religion in the world that uh, puts itself at risk historically. You can examine this and check those things out. So Thomas, it's, I'd say it's mildly heretical. Uh, Gospel of Mary and Philip and Judas, much more so. But then there's another kind of book that was basically Christian popular literature. You know, like you get uh, uh, Lucado, Max Lucado, who writes novels, this kind of thing. You, you get Christian uh, eye candy, if you will. <laughs> And they, they would write the stuff that may, be well, it may well be orthodox. There was this story about Paul and Thecla that was orthodox, but all fabricated, that came out in the late 2nd century. So, uh, do they go back to the historical Jesus? No. Uh, are they helpful for the Christian faith? No, I don't think so. Uh, are they interesting reading? Oh yeah, there's a lot of stuff that's fascinating. somewhere else. So, uh, I appreciate you all coming out today. Uh, P52, and the, day, the way we date any of these manuscripts, is through paleography. And what that means is it largely has to do with comparing handwriting of an undated manuscript to that of a dated manuscript. There's a lot of other details besides just the handwriting. But the handwriting has to do with Let's say I've got a manuscript that says, this is written in the third year of Augustus Caesar, and it's a note from a father to his child. And we can see how he's written his letters, the size of them, uh, and we've got, we've got thousands of those that are dated. Um, that can really tell us a whole lot about these undated manuscripts, and we can plug into that. So we say, the Alpha is never written like this except in, in AD 100 to 150, and the Beta is written like this only from 90 to 140 those kinds of things, you can kind of triangulate on a date. And so uh, that's how P52 is dated. But the closest dateable manuscript to it was AD 96, that C.H. Roberts discovered. The second closest, but it had a couple of differences, was AD 152. So that's, that's how it was dated. Well, thank you folks for coming out tonight. I hope this was uh, informative. And uh, I hope uh, for you Christians it uh, strengthens your faith. And if you're not a Christian, that you're challenged by it. You think about some things.